Hi everyone, this is our concussion Q&A. So I figure I do an about me slide. So I started working here at Black Stone Valley Physical Therapy Services in December 2019. Um, I went to UMass Lowell. I got my doctorate in physical therapy there and then I did my undergrad there as well in exercise physiology. Now since I've graduated I've worked mostly in outpatient um, physical therapy so working on a vast majority of patients with the typical orthopedic injuries like ankles, backs, like all total body, but I also have experience with like vestibular dysfunction or people who get like vertigo or, you know, dizziness and things like that, concussions, cervical dysfunction, and that can, those kind of overlap a lot with concussions as well. Um, for certifications, I'm certified in functional dry kneading levels one and two, which is something else that we started offering when I started working here. And then uh, complete concussion management is the course that I took uh, for this training to really go over more in-depth, up-to-date research for everything. And then also the selective functional movement assessment. So that's really good just for total body assessment as well, which plays in well with some of my other certifications. So for fun, I like to do yoga. I teach yoga here when COVID's not happening. So hopefully eventually we can open that back up. I like to go hiking, do different group fitness classes and there's our contact information. So we discussed this a little bit in the last video I made, like what are concussion symptoms and how do you diagnose a concussion? So you only really need one of these symptoms after an impact to have a concussion. You don't need to have headache and balance issues and all that. It could even be something that lasts a few seconds and then that's considered a concussion. So if you look at this list, any single one of these things, if someone, you know, even gets hit and their head doesn't get hit by the impact, they could still have like a whiplash that can cause the brain to still have that shearing force to cause a concussion, which is really, really, really crazy. So when should you come in for PT for a concussion? Now, ideally, you you know, you suffer a head injury, right? You first want to rule out like any red flags. Like maybe you've gone to the ER, maybe you haven't, but you should get in to see a physical therapist within 24 to 48 hours. Now that's something that if you were to call me, tell me you just got in, like we'd make room for you on the schedule. But like I said, the key thing is ruling out red flags. Now, what are red flags? Those are things like skull fracture, you know, any sort of cervical spine instability, you know, any new numbness or tingling, especially in the arms and legs. If you have a lot of midline neck tenderness, um, and some of this is at that central nervous system testing that physical therapists can do. So that's something like testing your reflexes or just looking for other signs that um, can indicate there's a problem with the actual brain, like the brain stem or, or spinal cord. Now, when you come in, sometimes people only need three visits. So visit one, we basically go through like the history of what happened. We go through the neurological testing. And then it's a lot of education of understanding what's happening to me with a concussion and knowing that it's okay to be feeling the way you are and how we can make it better. And I think having the understanding really can relieve a lot of anxiety for people, especially because a lot of times people are taken out of their activities and it's just hard when you can't get out and do things. And I think a lot of people have felt that too um, with everything that's gone on in the past few months. Now, with that, we can actually diagnose the concussion if it has not been seen. However, the doctors are the ones you'd have to go to for an actual letter to stay like out of work and school. Physical therapists can definitely write a letter of their opinion, but under our licensure, it still needs to be followed up with a doctor's care type thing. Visit two. So once we've gone through, ruled out any red flags, diagnosed a concussion, done those sorts of things, that's when we're gonna be looking at a Buffalo treadmill test. So basically what that means, it's a treadmill and we slowly increase the incline. Um, and we measure heart rate and your rate of perceived exertion. So how hard is it when you're um, walking on the treadmill? And we wanna get a baseline of how dizzy are you to start? What's your fogginess level? What's your headache and what's your nausea? So all of those things we'll measure on a scale of like zero to 10. And then if any one of those things 
increase by three, then you're done with the test and that's your threshold that we can determine from there. So that way, if you know, okay, when my heart rate's at 120, I get, become symptomatic, then we'll keep you just below that threshold to begin with. So there's different ways of figuring that out and that should change with time. If you pass the test, that's when we would go to visit three the Blackhawks test. So this is more of like, especially for athletes, a return to read readiness to play. So this tests more of like the total body systems of like trying to aim for, you're going back to practice, what sort of things do you do in practice? And it's a standardized test that helps with those things. So you go on the bike, we'll work on single leg uh, testing as well as um, some agility testing and see how you do and see if you become symptomatic and look at those same things that we did with the Buffalo treadmill test. And if you pass that, then you're good to go back to play. And that's how we determine whether or not it's safe. Now, let's say you are out of work versus at a like, sport, then we may not need to even get to the Blackhawks test. We may only need the Buffalo treadmill test, but it just depends on what your demands are and what your typical lifestyle is like. Now, here's the big one that we see all the time. What if you have symptoms months later? Still come in for PT because honestly, it's the most common referral for concussions we get are those who, who don't recover. But the big thing with concussions is making sure that you have early care, and then that can help prevent a lot of the long-term effects, especially preventing second impact syndrome, which is where you get hit in the head um, and cause a second concussion within a short period of time of that first concussion. And that's when symptoms can really take months longer um, than they should versus only being like a few weeks to a month. So it's very similar to acute and like how we'd break down when you come in what we're going to look at. But still first looking at the history, your neurological testing, and doing a lot of education because at this point, a lot of people have felt, oh, that like they can't do things. You know, they feel very limited and they can't figure out what their aggravating factors are. So with that, it can be very depressing and can be very anxiety inducing talking about these symptoms and almost people become like hyper aware of certain things and it's good to come in and have someone objectively look at you and see those things. So visit two, once again, same as acute, we would do the Buffalo treadmill test. Um, and then visit three, this is when we get more into some of those prolonged problems. So first we wanna rule out is your heart rate an issue? Are you having any like heart rate problems where you can't walk up a hill or you can't do your exercise? If it's not that, then we wanna look at some of these other things because a lot of the times the neck gets missed and a lot of the muscles because every single concussion is also a whiplash injury and a whiplash injury takes a lot less force than a concussion. So if you have a concussion, you automatically have that whiplash injury. Now, some of the visual stuff, some people will complain about like that blurred vision listed on the symptom slide, or even like double vision. It just means that the eyes aren't working properly and it's a lot of reflexes. So even the muscles in the back of our neck, they actually contract when we look at our eyes. It's like a reflex that happens. So when we talk about the vestibular system, that's basically the inner ears working in conjunction with our eyes and our neck. So if any one of those things is off, it can really throw off our balance, you know, what we're seeing. And as we get more fatigued, these things can get worse. So that's why it's really good to do a full assessment and take the time to figure out safety precautions and then go in through test the heart rate and then go in and test those other things kind of in that order. Now each concussion is very different and it, everyone can take different periods of time to recover. Now it can depend on having multiple concussions, it can depend on like how much force you were hit with, however they're still kind of determining what makes one concussion worse than the other. I think the biggest thing is if you're not expecting the concussion. So if like two players collide, the player that sees the other player going for the ball probably won't have as bad of an injury as the player who doesn't expect that hit and then they get that they didn't have time to tense up. So that cervical stiffness doesn't happen and that's why reaction time and things like that can be ways of almost preventing a concussion and just making sure people are more aware of those sorts of things. And we can get more into that in some of the later slides. 
So this is the protocol I use for return to work and for return to sport. And as you can tell by looking at this, it's very much symptom oriented and to see how much they can tolerate. And it's, okay, you're gonna start at this level, very, very low, and then we're gonna slowly increase you. And then once you feel good at that level, then we'll go up to the next level. Now you can see, it's not till five that you're at a full day of work in school without any like restrictions. Once you get there, you want to make sure for athletes, especially they play in a practice, a full practice before they get into a full game. So that's one of the things that um, you want to make sure, especially between four and five here. Now, you really want the athletes especially to be completely asymptomatic while they're going back to school in their sport. Otherwise, they still need to be in to see you because they could be having some other dysfunction. Now, for people with work, a lot of times it's like car accidents and that a lot of times affects multiple joints. Not everyone gets like necessarily hit straight forward and back. They could be turned. They, you know, the seatbelt can pull them back at an angle. They can get hit with the airbag. There could be lots of different reasons for multiple joints, like the entire spine being affected as well as the brain. And I would say almost all car accidents, especially where the airbags deploy, there's probably concussion involved. Now, how do you know how bad the concussion is? So all concussions are a mild traumatic brain injury. Those two terms are synonymous. But the key is when something's a mild traumatic brain injury, it has a reversible energy deficit. So what that means is that the cells in our brain, you know, will eventually recover from that. Now, the real question is, have you had multiple concussions in a short period of time? That is the one thing that you can prevent. If you can get removed from play immediately after sustaining that concussion, and then you're out for like a week or so, then you go back in once you've gone through PT and you get cleared, that's gonna be the safest course of action for all the athletes and prevent that second concussion so that way you're not going back too soon. Now, a lot of it might depend on your symptoms and aggravating factors, and it could just be that you need to build up a tolerance. Very few people just need rest. It's usually the people who never rested that really could benefit from like a week off of doing nothing. But most doctors now tell people to rest to avoid activity. But the only problem with that is that can be really damaging for people who are used to being active and like going out with friends and getting back to that team environment for those athletes can be really good on the mental health aspects. Um, I also use a scale of zero to 10 for pain, dizziness, fogginess, headache for all of those. And I said, in general, like when you're trying to do activities, if it goes up more than like a three out of 10. So if you were out of three to start and it gets up to a six, that's probably the threshold. You don't really want to go above that threshold while you're doing activity. You also want to see how long it takes you to recover to get back down to that three out of 10 symptom. Um, now, all of this is based on function, how long ago the concussion occurred. So if it's been a really, really long time, symptoms tend to be a little bit worse. Same thing too, if there's any history of mental health issues, then that can actually exempt, like make everything else worse. Um, just because a lot of this is the mind and knowing where you are. So that education piece of knowing that this isn't permanent, this can go away, can be really, really good for people. So getting in early and getting that education can be really, really helpful. Um, so that's why coming in within that 24 to 40 hours is so important. So some of the other questions. So what symptoms are more serious than others? So I would say once you've ruled up some of the red flags, any affecting the brain stem or the cerebellum. So those are parts of our brain that we test for. So we look at our cranial nerves. So you know about like nerves in the body connecting to different muscles and things. These cranial nerves come off of our brain stem and they control different things like with our eyes, our hearing, even all the way down to our digestion. Um, so we can test for those when you come in for physical therapy. We can look at coordination. So if all of a sudden you're just not walking normally uh, or you can't do certain movements you could before, like rapidly turn your hand back and forth and things like that, we can test for that. 
And you know, when like the doctor uses the reflex hammer and like hits your knee, um, we can test those at all different levels throughout the upper extremities and the lower extremities, just to make sure that those are normal. And a lot of times the patients report they're different, then um, we can probably determine there might be something else going on within the brain. Now, the big thing is you don't want to have anyone having a brain bleed, you know, a skull fracture, some of those red flags from before. But I would say those are probably some of the more serious symptoms just because those are actually the brain and could take a little bit more with the rehab. Now, compared to like having just like neck stiffness because the neck having problems there can actually cause some symptoms that replicate a concussion like blurred vision. You know, it can also cause referred headaches coming up and around, which isn't something that you usually think about. Now, another question that was posed is you have a concussion and then you're told to stay awake afterwards. Now, that is because they're looking for a brain bleed or any sort of serious injury. So you do want to stay awake. Um, the reason now they want more attention to the concussions and things is they don't want to have anything serious happen because someone went home and went to sleep. Usually if someone's worried about a skull fracture or a brain bleed, they should be sent to the ER. Same thing too, if someone seizes from hitting their head too hard, that's another red flag to be going in and seeing the ER doctors. Um, I think now People are a little bit more aware of this than they were like 10 years ago in the seriousness of concussions with awareness. Um, but yeah, you definitely want to stay awake. Now, let's say resting after concussion. You've been to the ER, you've ruled out some of those red flags. It's like you're told now, okay, you want to stay in a dark room and avoid electronics. Now, that can be good to an extent. So some people will sleep more, you know, because they need it for their brain to kind of recover because they're in that overactivated state. But then what can happen is some people you'll see wear sunglasses indoors. That's actually not something we want people to do. If they're wearing them outside, it's fine. But with light sensitivity, it can take a really long time because you get used to wearing them inside all the time. So long-term use of wearing sunglasses inside actually isn't good. Um, I'd actually recommend modifying activities, so just reducing the amount of like thinking you have to do and some of the physical exertion is definitely important. But the key is to stay mentally healthy. So if going out and seeing some friends is going to help your mental sanity during your recovery process, it's probably worth going and seeing people and just not staying in that dark room for long, long periods of time. However, you may need that dark room to help you go to sleep and just let your brain shut off. Just probably not 24 hours a day. Now, another question is, is it okay to be on your phone? Now, blue light can be irritating. So that's why they make something called like Felix Gray glasses, which basically take out the blue light. They have other versions of those now. So the blue light is what we see with like computer screens and our phones. And now time they have like night light mode and things like that, just to take away that bright light to help people sleep. And I even think some of the sleep research shows that using that blue light right before you go to bed isn't good for you as well. So is it possible to diagnose a concussion months after the injury? So I would say that a concussion is usually the first one to two weeks, depending on your age. Once you're past that, it's actually called post-concussive disorder, where you're having a lot of those ramifications from other systems in the body being affected. It's not just one system. So with that, you want to make sure that you come in and get treated. Now, how to be more mindful of symptoms and like when to take a break. Um, the people want to know when it's okay to exercise. For me, it's all about monitoring systems and then using for me that three out of 10 increase in symptoms. Um, and that may depend on the patient. It may depend on how far out they are. If it's been a really, really long time, that's when you definitely want to push people a little bit more. Um, but the key here is to monitor symptoms and just become aware of how bad is it becoming and then can you recover from that? That's the other key part, portion of it. Is anyone the same after concussion? Now, it can take a while. Your brain should heal within a couple of months um, unless there's that second impact really close together. So many symptoms um, can really affect 
certain people because they weren't treated appropriately. I find that the cervical neck tends to be a big problem that's often neglected. They'll do some of the vestibular training, but forget about this. So if we can get that loose and get it back in training appropriately, it's not even necessarily about having the neck be super strong. It's about being able to get that stiffness and be able to react to things as well. Um, and that's the reason too, like sometimes we'll do baseline testing. So if you want to prevent a concussion, people can come in for physical therapy without having an injury. And they can say, I want to learn about concussion and see what I can do to test my baseline. That's when we'll test some other things, like reaction time and just see how your eyes are working and things like that. Now, how to deal with recurring symptoms and pop-up headaches. So a lot of the times people may feel fine one day and then symptoms come back. So some of that may be you need to come in for PT. Some of it may be you need to learn what to do for self-treatment. And if you don't quite know what to do, that's when you should definitely ask a professional. One of the tricks I've learned, if you have a lot of tightness up in the cervical spine, is to either get one of those balls that are shaped like a, a peanut, or you can tape two tennis balls together and lay right on that, and that'll help some of those muscles loosen up. A lot of the times, the headaches can actually be coming from the upper neck, but you probably won't be able to determine that without a full evaluation. So, what are the long-term effects of a concussion? So this really just depends on the patient um, and it really just depends on what areas were left untreated and like what was missed. Now there's definitely talk of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, which they've done a lot of research with the football players. And with this, they can't actually prove that having multiple concussions has caused these things because they haven't also tested the population. It could be related to other things, maybe even like steroid use or other things, but they haven't done enough research to say for certain that multiple concussions causes CTE. Um, do minor concussions have long-term effects? I would say if they're mismanaged, they definitely can. Um, that's just the key thing is getting treated and seeing a healthcare professional early on. Is there baseline testing that should be done if I've never had a concussion and can I prevent a concussion from happening? So we touched on this a little bit on the last slide, but yes, a concussion is usually um, worse from an unexpected hit. So, and like I said, it doesn't have to necessarily be your head. It could be the ricochet effect um, and then the brain shearing inside. So what we look at with the baseline testing is the history, symptoms, your short-term memory, um, balance, using like a drop stick reaction time test. So what we would do is basically drop a stick uh, down for your hand and see how quickly you could grasp it. And then we can measure the distance so we can get a measurable outcome for that. Grip strength, because sometimes people may have neck issues that may cause the grip strength to weaken. Delayed memory recall. So I may ask you something in the very beginning and then have you remember it by the end of the treatment without telling you that's what I'm testing. So that one can be pretty key and people can have a really hard time with when they're having memory problems. And the impact is basically a test that's now given out to most high school athletes. So uh, sometimes we'll do that in here, but for the most part, 